Hey there and thank you for joining me on the Retro Game Couch. In this video we're going to try and get this Commodore PC-10 3 back in working order because as it sits here it's not working. Uh, it has a few issues. As you can see it's missing a drive. It came without the hard drive. It didn't come with the keyboard and it didn't come with a monitor. So I think I have all the components here to get this working and the goal is to get it working and play a game on it because we are the retro game couch. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's go! Let's plug in some power and see what it does. Now I don't hear any fan spin from the power supply. But I did hear the um, disk drive turning on, so it does get power. So let's start by opening up the machine. These systems are notorious for having a battery on the main board that leaks uh, after a while. And this system was no exception, there was a leaking battery inside, which I removed. There's a reset switch here on the side, and when you take off um, it slides to, to the back. You need to make sure you don't yank off the reset switch. So it's uh, pretty bleeding obvious what is wrong here. The fan is right here and as you can see this little plug is disconnected from the main board. So I think if we put this here, let me see, plus on that side, it should probably work again. So we can test it right now actually. That works. Looking closer at the main board, here are the 8-bit ISO slots, all three of them. And here is the CPU, an 8088 by Intel, manufactured by AMD. Back in these days, AMD made chips for Intel. It's pretty fun to see those two brands on one chip. And there's room for a co-processor here, a math uh, processor if I'm not mistaken. Of course the um, power supply goes here. There's uh, 640 kilobytes of RAM. Here is, well, probably the BIOS. Um, floppy connector, the floppy interface and the hard drive interface. And this looks like the standard 40 pin IDE interface, but it actually is the short-lived 8-bit XT IDE interface, so you cannot use default IDE drives, but we'll get to that later. So the, the board is looking pretty clean, uh, apart from where I removed the battery. I, I already removed the battery assets that were eating away the main board here. For a replacement battery we have various options, but it needs to be a 3.6 volt battery which is rechargeable. If you put in a non-rechargeable battery here, it will start leaking because the computer will charge, try and charge the battery. So I'm going to use this little enclosure that I bought on eBay, uh, which holds three rechargeable AAA batteries, totaling exactly 3.6 volts. Okay, so we have replaced the battery, now it's time to, I guess, reassemble and see what it does. So this computer not only has composite video as output, but also an RGBI connector. 
and I only have one monitor that has this RGB connection and that is my trusty 1084 from Commodore. So let's see if that works. It's set to RGB and let's see what it does. Now as you can see, it's not working. Uh, this computer outputs 60 Hz NTSC signal and this is a PAL monitor. I can switch between digital and analog RGB and it really makes no difference at all. So I can't get RGB working. Let's try composite. Set this to composite and let's see what it does. That works really, really nice. So we have a screen now and we can continue our restoration. Now, just as an extra test, I got out my 1701 monitor, uh, which also does composite. And see if this also likes the output of my Commodore PC-10. That's composite. Is it set to front? It is. Let's turn it on. Now, weirdly enough, this doesn't sync. And I think my monitors are both PAL, but this monitor doesn't like the composite output of the PC-10. And I found a fix for this, which I'm gonna show right now. The fix actually is a little NTSC to PAL converter. Connect this up, set it to PAL output. Okay, now let's run this PC-10 output to the input pin of the little converter. Connect the output pin of the little converter to my 1701. Start it up again. And this works. So the next challenge is the hard drive. And because it didn't come with a hard drive, I had to source one. Now it uses the XT IDE interface and there are only a handful of hard drives that this system supports. And they range from 20 to 40 megabytes. Um, and if you look on eBay, the prices of them are $100 and up. So way too much money. And I want this to be a little more versatile. I want to use compact flash cards like I do on most old systems because they are just more reliable. So I went online and I started looking around and there is something called the XT IDE interface card. The XT IDE is an 8-bit ISA adapter for attaching modern hard drives, disk on module or DOMs and compact flash to the ISA bus. When paired with the XT IDE universal BIOS, it allows IBM PC compatibles to boot from IDE devices otherwise not supported. This is perfect for this Commodore PC-10 that only has 8-bit ISA ports and its onboard hard disk controller only supports a handful of hard drives by default. The card I am using is made by Glitchworks. They sell the XT IDE boards pre-assembled and as a kit. I bought the cheaper kit and soldered it together myself. I also bought from eBay this little IDE to compact flash adapter and I have, I always have a big stack of compact flash cards. This is a 16 megabyte compact flash card which kind of fits the size of the original hard drives. So we're going to put that in the adapter and we're going to put the adapter in the IDE interface card. And let's screw it into the system and see if it boots. It seems like the perfect place for my little interface. So that is basically it. It now should be able to run off this compact flash card. I need to move a jumper that is located near the XD IDE interface because this jumper enables or disables the onboard um, interface.
Yes, it turns on. Okay, so now it's just permanently on, which is totally fine. For the keyboard we have two options. We either use the original keyboard that came with this unit, which I didn't have at the time that I bought this, or you use an AT keyboard, which is not compatible with the XT standard in this uh, computer. Sometimes it'll work, actually, sometimes I hook it up, I start it up and it works. So I was really confused at first why the keyboard stopped working. What you actually need to get an AT keyboard working is an AT to XT converter. The AT to XT keyboard converter is a product that has its origin on the vintage computer forum. The product's purpose is to develop a keyboard adapter that allows users to attach AT keyboards to XT class computers. The product is entirely open source and is based upon the PIC12F629 IC. I was fortunate enough to find someone on the vintage computer forum that was willing to sell me a pre-assembled unit with a nicely 3D printed case. So the other option is of course using an XT keyboard. They are a bit harder to find, a bit more expensive. I found somebody in the Commodore 64 128 Facebook group who was kind enough to send me the original keyboard that came with this unit. His name is James. James, you are the man. He sent me this for only shipping. So this one doesn't need a converter. We just simply plug it in here on the side and it'll just work. Now the last thing I want to address is the big hole here. I have two options for filling up the hole. I can insert a second floppy drive, diskette drive. I got this very cool bracket uh, from Patrick from the Netherlands, a mutual Commodore enthusiast who sent me this. Uh, and I just inserted a default 1.44 uh, megabytes uh, floppy drive, which probably won't work on the Commodore PC-10. I haven't tried it, but I, I think I want to go for this bad boy. This is my latest purchase, not sure if it works, but this would fit really, really well. I think it's time to put the lid back on. I think I've done everything on the inside. The only thing that I didn't do yet is make a longer cable for the IDE connector. I have here three floppies uh, version 5.0 of MS-DOS. This originally came with MS-DOS 3.0, I think, or 3.2, something in that region. Uh, but these are my only 720K floppies with DOS on it. So let's try and see if we can boot from a floppy and then perhaps format the compact flash. Okay, so it's gonna let me choose between floppy or drive A, which is this one. Okay, this is the setup. It seems still seems to have the NTSC PAL problem because this is not in color and I really want to have color. Let me get my converter back. Well, sorta. It is in color, but it's, it's a mess. Do I need to get my 1701 back? Okay, so DOS is finally done copying. It says press enter. I think it's gonna reboot now. And let's see if we can boot from the hard drive. It says boot sector found on my hard drive. Yes, it is booting. Yeah, okay, so we're in the command, pr command prompt. So let's try and play a game. 
Bruce Lee. It seems to be working. Uh, TP, TP set to composite or RGB? Composite. Haha. <laughs> we got a game in color with music from the PC speaker. This is this is very cool. So we got it working. Um, one player versus computer. Yeah. Who? That was dumb. This is working. So uh, Bruce Lee, very, very nice. So that's it for this video. Restoring this Commodore PC-10 3 to working order. There were a lot of challenges. The hard drive, as you remember, uh, you cannot use an IDE hard drive. The keyboard was a real challenge. Found a converter for that. I re replaced the drive to fill this hole. And we found a monitor that works. Probably if you're an American with an NTSC monitor, you won't have as much trouble as I had, but uh, for me, this is the only solution with the Chinese converter. So for now, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time on the Retro Game Couch.